analysis about the horticultural industry is intrinsically interesting. It's an interesting thing to do because we're not just talking about one or two commodities, but a whole bevy of products. And each of those products have their own market influences and challenges. So to analyze the industry as a whole, what we have to do at Abers is to identify broad trends and those commonalities across products that enable us to say something that's not just informative, but that contributes to the public and policy narrative around this sector that is increasingly complex, diverse, and growing. My presentation today is going to be divided into two parts. The first part is to give a brief overview of the horticultural industry's export performance in recent years, highlighting some of those positive changes we've seen across industries and to explore some of the influences behind that growth. The second part of my presentation is going to summarize some of the findings from research undertaken by two of my colleagues, Charlie Shaw and Rowan Nelson, who are in the room with me today. And what that article has done is to look at some of those areas where Australia has a comparative advantage in its horticultural sector, and also those areas where we could be doing better. That article is in the agricultural commodities publication that you got in your satchels. The hoard industry is mainly focused on the domestic market. On the whole, we export about 30% of what we grow, but that statistic varies massively across products. We export more than 70% of our table grapes and our macadamia nuts, over 60% of our almonds, and 30% of our carrots. Here at home, we have a vibrant retail sector for fruit and veg, and a number of smaller distributors all vying for a share of that market. Distributors of produce are increasingly using new techniques, to market and deliver fresh fruit and veg with an emphasis on not just quality but also convenience. I am not going to get into that in my presentation today because Elliot and Ryan are well versed in that and will be sharing their views on that with you. I'm going to be focusing on our trade side and not on imports. We can leave that to the Q&A and I'm happy to answer questions on that. I am going to be focusing on the export side. Closer to home though, this is gross value of production. What you can see here is that over the past four or five years, the gross value of production for the horticultural industry has been increasing. And the two biggest drivers behind that have been fruit and nuts. <laughs> or just me. <laughs> Looking good. There we go. <laughs> um, and on, on that growth, there are really two stories. Uh, one is on the domestic side where we have really not seen much growth in total fruit and nut and vegetable consumption. It's really been in line with uh, population growth. But what we have been seeing is a strengthening of demand for high quality produce available year round. And that has fueled investment in a range of products like avocados and blueberries and other things. The other part of the story has been on the strengthening demand in our export markets, which has fueled better returns for our products. And that has come back into our industry and fueled investment in table grapes and nuts, etc. And what we have now is a burgeoning industry and a number of orchards that have been planted in recent years that have not yet come into full bearing, but that will over the next three to six to ten years. And that's going to see total production increase and the gross value of production increase. So what is the makeup of our exports? The value of Australia's fresh produce, this is really something. Thanks, guys. At the back. We have the tech guys at the back. Uh, the value of Australia's fresh produce exports has more than doubled since 2010. Uh, last year, it was worth about $2.1 billion. Now, this reflects export performance in a number of fresh produce, like the ones I mentioned before. Both almonds and macadamia exports have been flourishing, and to a lesser extent, but still important, have been our exports of carrots and onions and potatoes and asparagus. So why have our exports grown? Pardon me for a second. This is what I want to focus on. Why have our exports grown? Well, one of the factors has been about growing food demand in emerging economies. That means economies that have had strong rates of economic growth. And why that matters is because strong economic growth translates into 
higher household incomes. And when you are a country with a part of the population that's coming out of poverty, those people who are earning more want to eat more until they reach a certain plateau. And then it's not about how much they're eating, but what they're eating and increasing the diversity of the things that they eat. And we know about this huge trend towards migration towards urban centers where they get exposure to these non-traditional foods, non-staple foods, and you get a strengthening demand for those products that aren't necessarily being produced in a country and that are being imported or that they need to supplement their domestic supply with imports. Now what I've illustrated here is per person fruit consumption in our three North Asian markets with which we've negotiated FTAs. This is just an example. Japan has been a developed country for a long time and per person fruit consumption has stayed relatively steady. Economic growth in, in Korea was strongest through the late 80s and 90s, and you can see that per person fruit consumption grew over that period before tapering off. And then there's China, that strongly upward sloping red line. Now this data ends in 2013, so I don't know if it's plateaued or not. It comes from the FAO, and their food consumption data is always a bit late. But even, and certainly there are cultural differences between these countries and their eating patterns. But even at about 90 kilograms of fruit per person per year, as you see here, that seems high, but by comparison, in Europe, per person consumption is more around the 100 kilograms per person mark. So if you consider the size of the population and how much economic growth it's more poor sectors um, have to go and how that's expected to continue for the foreseeable future. This is an opportunity that exporters around the world for all commodities and especially horticulture have been taking advantage of and are expected to continue to take advantage of. What's also helped our exporters in recent years obviously has been the low exchange rate that has made our commodities more price competitive. And we've also been realizing the benefits of our free trade agreements as well as agreements on export protocols that happen outside of the free trade agreements. And tomorrow there's a session on non-tariff measures um, so that, that those issues can be explored a bit more. So over the past 10 years, with this kind of growth going on, it's led to a gradual and subtle shift in our exports, in the emphasis of our fresh exports. Certainly over the past 10 years, the five categories of our fresh horticultural exports have remained the same, but what's changed has been um, their share. Citrus exports continue to be extremely important, and in absolute terms, our exports of citrus have been growing. But in terms of a proportion, they've fallen to third place. What we've really seen and we all know about is how our almond exports have soared over the past four or five years. But that growth has been opportunistic growth based largely on the drought in California. They're the largest world exporter of almonds and their principal market was Europe. And as their production fell, Australian almonds filled that space. Once that drought abates, obviously our producers and exporters are going to try and hold on to as much of that market as they can, but they're going to have to increase exports to our existing markets and also find new ones because there's a lot of investment that's going into those orchards that still hasn't come into, that still hasn't come into full bearing yet. Table grape exports have grown significantly, particularly to our North Asian partners, in light of not only FTAs, which have lowered tariffs, but also the new protocols negotiated between governments that allow access to those markets. Those agreements revised fumigation and cold treatment protocols for table grapes, and they recognized Australia's pest-free regions for citrus and for cherries. And last year, we also negotiated market access additional to what we secured in the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement for some Australian fruit, including peaches and plums and apricots. What these agreements do is they open doors for our exporters, not just for the commodities being dealt with at that time, but also as a platform for future agreements and future discussions. What you'll notice from these pie charts is that the other fruit category has grown in share as well as in absolute terms. That's because over the past 10 years, we've achieved market access for a range of commodities where we either had none at all or we've expanded market access. And it includes a multitude of commodities from the ones I've just mentioned to much smaller ones you wouldn't even consider. But 
With this breadth of produce leaving our shores, there's a real advantage for exporters to start focusing on not just the domestic market, but diversify, diversifying their risk base to looking to what can be achieved in our export markets. I put up a graph of our three North Asian partners, but our partners extend well beyond that. Certainly our main partners are Asian countries, and as was discussed first thing this morning, we're not putting all our eggs or our apples in one basket. Asian countries are diverse, and they have different preferences. They're at different levels of economic development. So really, our advantage is, our advantage is in proximity to these markets. Certainly for fruit, China is our single largest market, but so are a number of other Asian partners. For nuts, EU has been our single largest market, but India is also important. And for vegetables, our exports are principally destined for the Middle East and a range of Asian markets as well. So I think I've illustrated sufficiently the trajectory of our exports. But what is interesting, and this is the issue that Hebert has explored, are the reasons why Australia continues to be successful on world markets. We've negotiated market access agreements, that's great. We've benefited from the lower exchange rate, which is also great, but a bit tenuous, because these things fluctuate. And we also have those protocols. But the fact remains that this industry operates in a very high cost environment. So how is it that we continue to have such success on our export side when here at home there are many constraints that are discussed a lot about the challenges we face as producers? That's because we, expo we export and we compete not just on price but on quality. And that is a very important aspect of what we do. And how we do that imposes cost, but it also comes with benefits. So there's a balance there. My colleagues explored our comparative advantage. If you explore that, you have to understand who your competitors are, what their advantages are, and what their production systems are. So our competitors are uh, mainly, there are mainly six of them. We have four south Southern Hemisphere competitors, New Zealand, Peru, Chile, and South Africa. We also compete with China, mainly for uh, vegetables, and with the United States for nuts. So some of the factors that uh, Rowan and Charlie explored dealt with a range of factors. Now, if we think about competitiveness, competitiveness of the industry starts with on-farm productivity and all the factors that go into producing efficiently. We have highly efficient and productive producers, but as I said, they operate in a high cost environment with high labor costs, high energy costs, and high utility costs. And because of that cost structure, success up to the farm gate also depends on the operator's skills and the use of technology and innovation as well. But competitive in the industry also extends beyond the farm gate. It extends to the ability of the whole supply chain to work together to create value or to create that premium, or at a very minimum, to not decrease the value that's achieved up to the farm gate through processing and transportation and marketing. We want to get the best quality products we can off the farm and to our consumers as quickly as possible. So all those facets of the supply chain have to work together. And then there are the supporting elements in the supply chain. The enabling institutional factors like property rights and governance and a well-functioning regulatory environment, which are all crucial to the cost of doing business, to doing investment, and, and even the industry structure. And then there are the macroeconomic factors over which nobody really has much control or any control, exchange rates and interest rates. So what did we find when we compared ourselves against our competitors? There are some unique aspects to Australia's competitive advantage that are difficult for our competitors to replicate. For example, Australia's competitive advantage in the horticultural, in horticultural industry partly depends on our availability of suitable land and on our ability to reallocate water to high-value horticultural uses such as almonds. And they do that through competitive water markets. Water markets are an institutional innovation that are currently unique, that, that uniquely benefit our industry and that our competitors really will not be able to replicate. But the, some of the problems with our other institutional success factors is that our competitors can catch up. Uh, competitors such as Chile are already developing similar investment environments and traceability systems that are necessary to compete with us on biosecurity and sanitation standards. How do we maintain that? 
Well, we can maintain the advantages of our policy and investment environment, one, by innovating in the areas of industry governance, research and development, and deregulation in ways that keep us just steps ahead of our competitors. And certainly the Productivity Commission has pointed out that we urgently need reform for some of our planning regulations so that we can, adopt, um, so that we can enable horticultural investment in areas close to the supply of labor. They also identify the need to adopt much more rapid means of assessing new agricultural chemicals, and including by recognizing equivalent overseas certification. And then there's our quality advantage. We have a quality advantage, and it's partly due to the skills in farming, as well as our skills in transport and in processing. And those facets sustain the value of fresh produce right along the value chain. Now, while those areas of our supply chain can be replicated, it's our early adopter status which is a huge advantage as long as we can sustain that through R&D and innovation, given the reputation and the, rep and the relationship we have with our consumers both at home and abroad. Future frontiers for this include the problem of uh, scaling cost-effective air transports, and there was a gentleman this morning who said he's involved in setting up uh, large air freight in parts of Victoria and the cross-industry challenge of creating multi-purpose cold transport chains that can optimize the quality of a range of different types of produce. Our quality advantage also extends to the efficiency of our system to monitor for and to regulate and to respond to biosecurity risks, such as an outbreak of pests or disease. I think if you've been reading the news lately, you know how relevant that is. This feature is crucial not only for maintaining our social license, both with our consumers here at home and abroad, but also for maintaining our market access. Because the loss of either of those things would be very costly for our industry, both in the short and long term, because it's very, it takes a long time to build up an industry, but it doesn't take very long to bring it down when an incursion like this takes hold. So we have to be able to demonstrate that we are responsive and on top of these situations. And what do we do about our ultimate challenge, the challenge of high labor costs and even access to labor? High labor costs mean that we have to work harder than our competitors to find these efficiencies through the supply chain. And where we have been able to introduce technology and innovation, we have. And where we haven't been able to do that with on-farm harvesting and handling, we've been able to compensate for some of the efficiency by upskilling our labor. But none of that diminishes that challenge. That isn't going away. So in summary, all the advantages and challenges that I've mentioned about this growing sector are important because we need to lock in our competitive advantage in those areas where we can to build an industry that is robust to any unforeseeable changes that might occur, uh, at least among them the exchange rate. It's been low for a while, but you know that's going to turn around. On the whole, though, the horde industry is continuing to work dynamically and is working in an environment that is generally supportive, uh, an institutional environment that is generally supportive to deliver the kinds of products that our consumers both here and abroad want. That is high quality products that are delivered reliably and that are produced in a safe and in an accountable environment. It's those qualities that will not only support our competitiveness but also our reputation and the growth of our industry and of our exports for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much.